Hi, welcome to Ions Health Talk with Dr. Akram. And I'm Akram. In this program, we'll be talking about all kinds of different health issues with different experts in the field. Today, we will be talking about ischemic heart disease and coronary artery bypass grafting. So sit back, relax, and enjoy your time with us. Despite increasing survival, cardiovascular disease remains the primary cause of death worldwide with an estimated 7.4 million annual deaths. The main symptoms of ischemic heart disease is chest pain, angina pectoris, most often caused by blockage of a coronary artery. The aim of coronary artery bypass surgery is revascularization achieved by surgically grafting harvested arteries or veins distal of the coronary lesion, restoring blood flow to the heart muscle. Ischemic heart disease was first described in the 18th century by Giovanni Batti Morgagni and Frederick Hoffman, who identified anginal syndromes and reduced coronary blood flow, respectively. It is estimated that 60% of the world's cardiovascular disease burden will occur in the South Asian subcontinent, despite only accounting for 20% of the world population. This may be secondary to a combination of genetic predisposition and environmental factors. Organizations such as the Indian Heart Association are working with the World Health Federation, Heart Federation to raise awareness about this issue. First of all, let's look at what is ischemic heart disease? Its symptoms, signs, how does it affect our lives? And what kind of remedies we got in store? Let's welcome our special guests. The three of them joining today. Dr. Shaquille Farid joining from Oxford. He's a consultant cardiac surgeon in Oxford and he is a director of FRCS cardiothoracic courses. And also Dr. Vivek Srivasta also joining from Oxford. He also works as a consultant cardiac surgeon at Oxford University Hospitals. And Dr. Chaudhry, our son from USA, he is a clinical professor of medicine in the University of Nevada, Las Vegas School of Medicine. And he is a, also director of cardiac catheterization laboratories, University Medical Center. Hello, welcome to our program. Hello, thanks for my patience. Shakil, how are you doing? Yeah, fine, thank you. We're awake. Thank you, yes, thank you for having me here. And Asan? Yeah. Hi, yeah. how are you? Oh, very yeah. good, very good. Nice to see you. Um, how is USA? USA is good. We are in Las Vegas. This is actually uh, midday. And uh, greetings from the USA. <laughs> <laughs> is it warm there in USA? Is Las Vegas, I suppose, yeah, it sounds like a nice holiday destination for me. It is warm, but COVID-19 is in full speed here. We are seeing a surge. <laughs> oh, yeah. but, but your patients are in best hands. I know you, we got the best specialists in our show today. But anyway, uh, and also I want to welcome my special guest, Hargo, who is here in our studio with us. She got so much interest in the program and she wrote to me about, you want to be in the show? Yeah. Can you tell a little bit about you, Hargo? Um, I'm 15. Um, I was wondering maybe if in the future I would like to do something related to medicine. So I thought it would be quite interesting to actually learn about it. And you got lots of questions as well. I can yeah. see you got lots of papers. That's interesting. I go. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, you should become a heart surgeon in future. Okay? <laughs> there you go. Good female heart surgeons in the world. <laughs> That's a good good idea. Here we go. Yeah. Don't, don't become a cardiologist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> By the way, Shakil, the head of surgery here in my hospital is Dr. Queen Ficus. She's a female surgeon. She is a female there surgeon. Oh, excellent. All right. That sounds good. So here we go. We got something to look forward, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is a live program. So call us on 0203-515-5788 if you have questions or suggestions. Or write to us, healthtalk at intv.co.uk. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook, Iron 
Health Talk with Dr. Akram. And of course, you can watch us on Facebook Live, intv.co.uk. Okay, let's go back. Vivek, how is Oxford? Hello. Oxford is good. I think uh, I have my good colleague here as well. And it's always better when he's around. But no, Oxford is good. Uh, thankfully, we are picking up on what we are able to do just now. So that is uh, that has been a bit of a problem in the last few days. But hopefully, we are looking to normalizing our activity. So thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, guys, joining with us today, and especially um, uh, Shaquille and Alsan. Both of them are on call for the hospital, and they are in the program because we planned it and we couldn't change it. And I'm, I'm really grateful for you, both of you, uh, being with us. And hopefully, nobody is going to call you during the program so we can conduct the program. Anyway, that'll be great. Okay, let's go back. Um, I can ask my good colleague, Mr. Vivek Srivastava, to cover me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm on the program. <laughs> you, you are by yourself, sir. <laughs> okay. Let's go back. Asan, can you say a little bit about uh, Scheming Heart Disease? What, what is this about? So, uh, when you talk about the, um, I would rather say coronary artery disease, the one that we see the majority of the deaths are due to, is actually the formation of the plaque buildup in the coronary artery that supplies the heart muscle. So these plaques can compromise the flow and that can lead to symptoms like chest pain on exertion. So demand supply mismatch. In many patients, it can be just plaques sitting there. There is no flow compromise and there is no symptom. So it can be asymptomatic and it can be symptoms with exertion because of the plaque built up and flow compromise with demand supply. But uniquely, as we all know, there is another problem with the plaque that these plaques can rupture or can get erosion and can activate the clotting system and the platelet activation and present as what we call acute coronary syndrome, meaning heart attack in different forms. Okay. So, what, we, what we're talking here about here is the blood vessel which is supplying to the heart muscles itself, isn't it? Correct. Exactly. I just want to make it clear for our audience. So this is, these are the special vessels which supply blood uh, to the heart muscle. Hagar, did you, you said you read a little bit about that. Yeah. Can you tell um, a little bit about it? Okay, from well, your perspective. Well, I read a bit about um, um, the vessels. Yeah. Um, and it's like when there's build-up, the blood might not be able to reach the heart properly, so it might not be able to function and could lead to a heart attack. So it can lead to heart attacks. That, that's what we're going for. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> okay. But it's important to realise that the presentation can be in a stable condition. That means the patient has some chest pain and there are some atypical symptoms. Particularly, we see that in the females, fatigue, shortness of breath, and these are like stable over time. But it can also present as sudden onset of chest pain, short of breath because of the plaque instability. So that you're, and, you're telling and somebody who's- At the who's same time, yeah. at the same time we want to uh, warn the uh, uh, patients and population particularly in South Asians, that many plaques can be asymptomatic. Those who have risk factors, and this is the preventive side, if we think about the pathophysiology of the coronary disease, many can be asymptomatic with plaques, but if I have risk factors, I need to be careful about the risk minimization so that I don't end up with plaque buildup and angina or for that matter, end up in heart attack. So what you're telling is, is that somebody who is normal, who has, who's, who's leading a normal life, suddenly get chest pain, and suddenly you realize that his heart has been, uh, his, the, this, this vessel's been blocked for a while. Is that right? Correct. Okay, okay. And Shaquille, how common you see patients being referred to you for heart surgery or for uh, this kind of surgery? 
Yeah, so specifically related to ischemic heart disease, we do see uh, quite frequently patients in preferred surgery. Now, um, if you think about all the patients who undergo angiogram, around 30 to 40 percent of them end up needing some form of treatment. Of those 30 to 40 percent, about 80 to 90 percent undergoes angioplasty, and 10 to 20 percent comes for surgery. Now, uh, people who have triple vessel disease, especially patients with diabetes or you know reduced heart function, or patients who have disease in the left main and we say, which is like near the origin of the artery, coronary artery, those patients actually uh, usually come for heart surgery. And being a big center, we do see quite a lot of uh, patients, like every week we get referred quite a lot of patients for coronary artery bypass grafting. So 20% of them being referred uh, with chest pain might end up with some kind of heart surgery. Is that right? Uh, no, so the number is not quite right. So if okay. you have symptoms of heart disease, you end up needing an angiogram. Out of those uh, 100%, around 30 to 40% need some form of treatment, whether it's stenting or surgery. Out of those 40%, around 70 to 80 percent undergo some form of stenting, only 10 to 20 percent. So, if you okay. look at the whole spectrum, I would say around four or five percent patients come for surgery. Come for surgery, yes. but still there are lots of other procedures we could do before they go to surgery. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, as a first step. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, can you, um, can one of you explain a little bit about this? blood supply to this uh, this heart like in quick format so we could make our viewers understand what we're talking about. So um, maybe do you want to do it? Yeah, maybe I can do that. That's fine. Um, and um, sorry, your uh, guest has read about the heart and conditions and probably read up about blood supply as well. But basically heart, like any other muscle, is supplied by arteries that supply the pure blood and uh, help the heart muscle function. Now, the arteries are quite small as you can imagine, so probably about at most two millimeters across and it doesn't take a lot of blockage or obstruction in there to affect how the blood flows through there. So these are arteries that come off the aorta, which is the big artery, the biggest artery coming out from the heart to supply blood to the rest of the body. And there are two arteries basically, one on the left side, one on the right side. And the left-sided artery is usually the most dominant in most people. So dominant, I mean, it is responsible for supplying most of the heart muscle in about 85% of the people. But it is only a short artery, and then it divides into two branches. One for the main pumping chamber, the left-sided heart, as we call it, the left ventricle, and the partition in the heart. And there is one branch that goes to the back of the heart. So the left side is covered by this uh, two big branches. And then there is a right-sided artery. It supplies the right side of the heart and the bottom of the heart. But between them, each of them is important because they are all responsible for supplying their own areas of the heart muscle. And uh, if there is a sudden heart attack, then, or if it's uh, a very uh, significant or uh, sudden event, then the other part, arteries are not able to cover for other arteries. And that results in damage to the heart muscle. But if it's a slow, gradual process, then sometimes we see that little channels develop within the heart muscle that cover for other areas and people can go on for a long time and that is why as Dr. Hassan uh, explained earlier, symptoms can suddenly appear but the disease process has obviously gone on for several years but because the heart has adjusted itself to it, it's kind of not evident immediately. Does that make sense? Thanks Vivek, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's excellent. We have a caller actually. Um, let's get the caller as well to join us the program. Hello. 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 Do you hear us? Welcome to Ian's Health Talk with Dr. Akram. I think there must, there must be a problem with call. Okay, let's continue uh, with the program. We, what are the uh, common uh, symptoms of 
uh, patients who seek help with you, uh, Vivek? Yes, uh, that is the interesting thing about the heart condition that we are talking about, ischemic heart disease. And as Dr. Hassan has already elaborated uh, in quite good detail, there's a whole range of symptoms that people present with. Okay? Classically, uh, what we describe as um, crushing chest pain or very severe chest pain is probably true only for a small minority of patients and public need to be aware that that may be one presentation and that certainly indicative of really uh, bad heart attack happening or really significant uh, affliction of the blood supply. But more commonly, people may experience just heartburn-like symptoms and are treated for reflux or treated as uh, uh, just heartburn and treated with antacids. But in effect, it may be just a reflection of um, lack of blood supply to the heart muscle and people just need to be aware that if it is coming on with effort and it is not really that uh, going away with just rest and uh, usual antacid treatment then it is something to be aware of and be actually persistent with your own doctor to kind of investigate it further. That's one way. The other presentation that people can have is um, I mean, a lot of our particularly South Asian population, uh, diabetic, and they may not even experience any symptoms until a proper major heart attack happens. But also, if uh, the heart muscle has been damaged or has been suffering for some time, it may only present as some breathlessness or exertion or more than usual effort. People may notice that they are feeling more breathless and not able to do what they were able to do, let's say, last year. So these are things that people should just be aware of and because it's such a high incidence of ischemic heart disease and especially our subgroup of population, it is just something that people should be uh, vigilant for and be actually investigating for it if required. And then of course if uh, it's a major heart attack, the UK usually will not subside and people should seek medical help. Asan, are, the, are these conditions reversible um, and can ischemic heart disease preventable? Okay, so let me uh, address your second question first. <laughs> uh, the clinical impact comes from the plaque burden, as you can imagine. And the more the plaque, the more is the flow compromise, and the more the plaque, there is a potential that the plaque can undergo a process called plaque rupture, plaque erosion, plaque fissuring, and present as what I call this acute ischemic. Ischemia means lack of blood supply. Acute means sudden. Acute ischemic scenario or chronic ischemic scenario. But if it is chronic, you have time to evaluate, right? But in the acute, you need to work very fast to save lives. We don't want to go to the acute situation. And therefore, if someone has the risk factors that we know from, for example, from the Framingham study, that high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, high, the obesity, and then um, all these uh, high cholesterol level, particularly the LDL fraction high, all these contribute. So if we can address this and minimize, these are all modifiable risk factors. We cannot do anything about the non-modifiable risk factors, which is the genetics, uh, which is the family history. But what we can do, and one important thing that I did not mention is the smoking. Very key that we, we address this and then we modify the disease, the risk factors, so that the disease does not come back in, 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 and, and take the lives. So that's the preventive side. The interesting question that you asked me, can it be reversed? So plaque, when we see in the artery, and that gives the plaque burden, and the more the plaque, there is the core of the plaque, if it is soft, it becomes vulnerable for plaque rupture and, and, and then activation of the clotting system and the platelet activation and full blockage of the artery 
and then we see the full-blown heart attack. But if you think about a therapy that regresses the plaque, that will be unique, right? We use the statins, and now we know that the statins actually stabilizes the plaque. So if I have plaque, it probably would be stabilized so it would not rupture or would not go through the ocean. So at least I would have less chance of an acute ischemic event. That's one thing. And also, another interesting thing about the reversal, there's actually a study called reversal. Dr. Steve Nissen from Cleveland Clinic was the PI, insulin investigator, and they showed that with aggressive statin therapy, if you do the intravascular ultrasound and assess the plaque volume, you actually see there is a regression of the plaque. So we go for the bad cholesterol particle called LDL and lower it down and down, go down to 70, even 50, then we may see some regression of the plaque. And remember, if the plaque volume is, is decreased even 10%, that will give you a higher lumen area. So even if I don't get a regression, even if I don't get a reversal, at least we can get stabilization of the plaque. So preventive measures are very important. Risk factors are very important. Understanding the pathophysiology is important. And now we are seeing from the even the UK studies, if you look at the CT angiograms, we can see the plaque without doing an angiogram because coronary angiogram, the invasive one, and Shaquille and Vivek, you guys know, this is basically a luminogram. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, does, it gives us the idea about the lumen, but the story of the coronary disease is in the wall of the artery. Mm -hmm. The CT angiogram is giving us insights about what's in the walls. So good questions, and yes, we can do things that can prevent. Okay. Uh, Shaquille Boy, uh, can yeah. you tell us, is, uh, is a surgery is the answer, or what, what else can we do? So, you know, if you have coronary artery disease, there are three ways of uh, managing the patient. So people who have minimal symptoms, who have single vessel disease, who have non-critical disease, however, a little bit of disease, they can perfectly be managed by giving medical treatment, especially, you know, elderly patients who do not have much symptoms. It's perfectly all right to treat them with medical therapy. As Dr. Chaudhary has said, you can give them aspirins, you can give them statins, you can give them drugs to slow down the heart rate a bit, and, and their outcome is pretty good. Then the next thing is uh, stenting. Stenting is done in patients who have single or double vessel disease and which are in in a geographically good position, you know, it's not in, near the origin of the artery or the uh, main stem of the artery. They're perfectly all right to have um, stems. And surgery is only reserved for people who have very critical coronary artery disease that is not amenable to stenting, or patients who have diabetes, who have multiple disease, or people who have very critical disease in critical vessel, which is quite risky to stenting or something, those patients actually uh, have good outcome with surgery. So we do surgery for two reasons. One is to give survival benefit. Another one is to improve the symptoms. So it's really important to, you know, uh, to realize that there are different ways of treating ischemic heart disease. It's not only surgery. And you know, most of the patients do very well after surgery. We have seen the long-term results, which are fantastic. I mean, uh, in UK alone, if you look at the data, only one, slightly over 1% 1 patient comes back for a repeat revascular revision following the coronary artery bifascography. If you look at the long-term result, the five-year survival, the 10-year survival, they are excellent. So, you know, bypass surgery is pretty safe now it can be done with less than 1% mortality, with very low risk of stroke, wound infection, things like that. So, you know, it's almost like having a routine operation. Our patients come on the day of the surgery, they get discharged. Most of the patients get discharged on day four or day five. 
it's only the really sick patients who need extended stay in the hospital. So yes, I mean, there are different ways of uh, dealing with ischemic heart disease. Thank you very much, Shakil. Uh, uh, yeah. Today we are talking about ischemic heart disease and uh, what we can do uh, for this, uh, especially the surgical management. Uh, so far we have talked a little bit about uh, ischemic heart disease. What is it? What are the <coughs> symptoms? What are we going to look for? And coronary artery bypass. And on our studio, I have a special guest here, who's Hogo, and who she's a student. And three other guests joined from uh, Skype. They came, um, it's Hassan who came from USA, and two consultants, car, cardiac surgeons, joined from Oxford. That's uh, Shaquille and Buwek. They are all with us. And today, uh, so far, we have talked a little bit about uh, coronary artery disease and um, what we could do, the initial bit. The, now, we're going to go to the treatment next. And if anyone joined today uh, in this program at this time, Please be with us and we're going to talk more about it. And uh, first of all, I'm going to take a caller and there's a caller online. Hello, sir. Hello, good evening. Good evening. What's your name, sir? Uh, it's Mahmoud Rahman. Mahmoud Rahman. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for calling us. Where are you calling from? Which part of... Are I'm you from... calling from Bath. Are you calling from Bath? That's excellent. Yes. What do you do generally? Are you um, a I'm medical... I'm retired now. I'm a university lecturer. Are you retired? I'm a chemical engineer. I'm retired. Are you, new, are you retired university lecturer? Okay, yeah. what is your question, sir? Uh, I had a heart bypass operation in 1995 when I was only 40 something. And uh, there was uh, four bypass grafts were done. Uh, the last angiography I had, 2018, uh, I went to a local hospital with chest pain and they thought I had a heart attack. So I was sent to Bristol uh, Royal Infirmary, and they said there's no heart attack. Uh, but anyway, they did the angiography then, and they found all the four bypass grafts are still intact. So that's very good news. Now, while there, they increased my statin to, uh, from 40 to 80 milligrams. Now, it is... Uh, I think uh, we found out through my cardiologist, Dr. Mansfield, in Royal United Hospital Bath, that the combination of DTSM, the other medication I have, with statin causes some difficulties, but which is not very clear. I have some symptoms like hot flashes, my head getting hot, some other symptoms, peculiar symptoms, like getting, you know, feeling blood vision, this sort of thing. Now, I have then, with consultation with my cardiologist, reduced the statin to 20 mg now. Now, with your discussion, Dr. Choudhury, the way he discussed, the higher doses of statin looks like helps to, if there is any plaque buildup. So, uh, my main medication is DTSM 90 mg twice daily, and aspirin, uh, I take 60 milligram uh, isosorbide mononitrate, and uh, these are the main medi heart medications. If you could advise me if I need to increase this statin or any other medication I need to, you know, to keep me well for the next. Thank you very much, sir. That's quite yeah. uh, quite uh, important and quite interesting question. I think it's uh, it's Alsan Chowdhury. Is, is yeah. it must be the so, best person uh, to answer let that. Me, let me um, tell you that in your case, I do agree with your cardiologist that the goal, if we can achieve the LDL, the the uh, target, the low seventy. And that will be probably you know that from the prove it trial that it is better. And if you look at the LDL level and the event rate, the lower the LDL level, the event rate is lower. Now, in your case, the question is how much dose is good? Whatever dose you need to achieve that is the, probably the goal. But we, the South Asians, we have a problem. And with the, our genetic constitution of the uh, enzyme, 
that metabolizes the statin, that is the cytochrome P450 system. I did my PhD from Southampton University, and, uh, and uh, that was my life, that uh, whenever you challenge a substrate that uses that enzyme, the enzyme expression is, is a problem, and that because it's less. And therefore, the side effects with a similar dose is going to be higher for South Asians compared to Caucasians. So the trick that we can do, try the lower dose, 40 milligram, see where is the LDL, or you can do a combination with ezetimabine and then see whether the LDL goes down. It sounds like you are not someone who is intolerant to statin, because intolerant patients, they cannot take any statin. But you are able to take but the higher dose can give you problem. And diltiazem, for example, is a drug that can cause the interaction so that it is also a, a inhibitor for the enzyme. So you may have a pharmacokinetic drug interaction with the statin giving more intolerance or side effects with the same dose when you are using uh, diltiazem. There is a potential. Now, in the totally intolerant statin, we use the PCSK9 inhibitors, which is totally different mechanism, and you probably don't need that. I would try this combination first, but I would discuss with your cardiologist. I'm not your cardiologist, but that's the strategy I will take. Thank you very much, um, uh, Asan. Um, are you happy with the answer, sir? Thank you very much. I think we dropped the caller. Thank you very much for calling us. Anyway, who got you, you, you wanted to ask some questions, then? Yeah, um, I've got a question for Dr. Vivek, if that's possible. Um, yes. Are there any occasions where you would refuse surgery, and why? Yes. So I think if you look at angiograms, and that is how currently traditionally decisions are made about who can have stents and who can have uh, a bypass operation, um, the decisions are based on what's called an anatomical basis. So we look at the angiograms and the coronary arteries may seem uh, very good to do bypass at the score or they may be quite diffusely diseased and that is one of the reasons why we may choose not to because the possibility of getting them benefit is quite low and putting them through a, uh, even though it has become a lot safer, the operation still carries a risk. And it may be that the risk is actually far more. So the two things that we have to weigh out is what benefits they stand to gain and what risk they face. Mm. So the risk can come from the procedure itself or the risk can come from what patient, patients are like. Patients may have various comorbidities and there are patients who the risk may not be one in 100 chance as we quote normally. Uh, and the risk may be much higher because they have other problems like lung conditions, they may have kidney problems, they may have liver problems and various other conditions that may cause them to be a much higher risk person for a standard operation. The procedure itself is probably similar for everyone, but their ability to withstand that operation may not be the same. So in that case, we have to make a careful assessment and if whether the benefit they stand to gain out of all this, is really worth taking and really worth uh, mm. uh, exploring. So that is one scenario where we may say, no, unfortunately, bypass is a very high risk option for you. And you may have to go either for stents as, as probably equivalent or maybe a better considering the circumstances or continue with medications. And it all depends on how the patient is. Sorry, I'll keep it brief, but we could. And, and we make that we are calling that right. we are calling the heart team approach now. Absolutely. We are in the same team. Absolutely. In the same team. That's, that's, that's the important thing, isn't it? <laughs> so, you, so you got the idea, so yeah. it's like it's not everyone yeah. who's been referred mm. to these cardiac surgeons get the surgery. Yeah. But sometimes the cardiac surgeons or any studies can refuse because the patient is maybe not fit for the operation yeah. or the operation mm -hmm. is not possible because uh, the 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 block or the plague is in funny place and they can't uh, mm -hmm. operate on it. Yeah. So do you want to ask some more questions? Um, I've got a question, but it's, it's a bit different. OK, you can ask um, it. Are there any other minorities that would possibly be at a high risk of getting the disease? 
as well. So we talked about, uh, so far, the South Asians are yeah. vulnerable for this heart disease. And uh, who goes asking whether if are there other, any other population or any other minorities are in higher risk? What about... Um, I can tell you the, uh, the US experience, um, because we have the uh, uh, Mexican-American population. Mm. We have the uh, Indian American populations. And what we know, and I see the same trend um, mm. that Dr. Selim Yusuf, who was in Oxford before and then moved to Canada, and his studies, you know, he showed that all these risk factors, the traditional risk factors that we know about that relate to the coronary artery disease, aside from the genetics part, if we get that early in our life, then we encounter this problem, the coronary artery disease earlier and also in more severe form. And we see that trend in every minority communities. We see that in Indian Americans with diabetes, obesity. We see that in Spanish population in the US. Uh, and, and, and it is like, to me, no more a surprise that when the risk factors come into play and appear early and we don't take any preventive measures, it's going to play out the same way. Yeah. Shakir, yeah. do you see any, any difference in the Middle Eastern population? Do they have any mm -hmm. uh, difference? I, in? Yeah, I think, I think the Middle Eastern population has uh, have quite uh, nasty disease as well, mm -hmm. from my experience. You know, I totally agree with uh, what uh, Dr. Chaudhary has said. I would like to add that, you know, your socioeconomic condition does play a role as well, because it has been seen that in poor, deprived areas, the incidence of heart disease is quite high, because, you know, a lot of them are not aware about their health needs, they don't go to the doctors for regular checkups. A lot of them live on fast food because it's cheap. There's lack of exercise, lack of education, and uh, you know the incidence of diabetes, obesity is very high in that in those populations. So you know, as uh, Dr. Chaudhary has said, that's a similar experience in UK as well. Uh, you know, fortunately, we work in a very good part of the country, which is Oxfordshire, and uh, you can actually see a distinct difference between the uh, between the demographics of the patients we get from Oxfordshire itself and from outside Oxford, like people who are coming from big cities like London, you know, very crowded areas. So I think this is something which is really important. What kind of uh, preparation you make before surgery, uh, Shakil? So uh, before surgery, uh, one is preparation of the patient, obviously, and preparation of the surgeon. So preparation of the patient is uh, you need to make sure that the patient is fit for an operation. So how do you determine that? So you take a history, thorough history, to see whether there are any major comorbidities. Then you perform some clinical examinations. And finally, you do some tests. So fortunately, in most of the cardiac centers in the world, there are pre-op assessment nurses who actually make sure that all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted. So basically, the patients have blood tests, patients have chest x-ray, the ultrasound of the heart, which is known as echocardiogram. And if any of these investigations pick up anything bad, then we do further investigations like CT scans or any specific tests that's uh, needed. Finally, you know, it gives us an idea about the risk profile of the patient, and we use a risk scoring system, which is known as the Euroscore. And when you enter all the data that you have got from the clinical exam and investigation of the patient, it gives you a rough estimation of the risk. For example, if someone is under 60, coming for a bypass operation, doesn't have any history of anything at all, no major comorbidities, his risk of death is around 0.5%, according to the Euroscore. The same individual, if he has other problems like uh, diabetic, on insulin, has lung disease for which he's on inhalers, and he has any other major problem like neurological problems, his risk profile goes up, like his risk of death can be 4 to 5%.
So, you know, these are really important to assess the patients uh, properly. And when I say, the other thing I say about preparation for the surgeon, I think it's really important to be focused before you are going in for a surgery. So personally, what I do is, before when I'm scrubbing for the operation, I try to rehearse the operation in my uh, head, in my brain, and I, th I find it quite useful because you are quite focused, and it's important to get a good night's sleep, you know, eat properly. These are all important things. For you, it's just another operation, but the guy, person who is having the operation, it's his life at stake. You know, you have to think about the long-term and the short-term outcome of that patient. So, yes, I think it's really important for the surgeon to be prepared for the operation as well. That's quite, in put Shakir. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite <laughs> interesting. That's quite interesting, yeah. Um, Let's talk. Uh, do you have any more questions you want to ask? Um, you can ask Vivek anything. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so what exactly would you do to the artery during the surgery? Sorry, is that for me? Yeah, he's asking uh, Vivek. Uh, okay. Uh, right, okay. So, yeah, like I was describing earlier, the arteries are quite fine. So most surgeons would use magnifying glass. So when we are in theatre, now, techniques may vary, but effectively what a bypass operation is doing is creating a bypass route for blood flow to flow around the obstruction or the narrowing that is in the artery. So we look at those arteries, we assess where, based on the angiogram, where the bypass needs to go so the downstream blood supply is clear. And that's where we then open up this artery, tiny incision, probably about four millimeters, five millimeter long incision there, uh, which is a So you need to artery. open into the chest before that, isn't it? Yes, of course, yes. Okay. Uh, so most bypass operations would be done through the chest, chest. Uh, and through the middle of the breastbone, the sternum. Uh, some surgeons do use the spaces between the ribs to go get into the chest. And then we most commonly what blood supplies we use to divert to the heart are the mammary artery, which is the arteries that run along the side, the breast bones on the sternum side, which is the left mammary artery is the most commonly used conduit, conduit meaning something that provides blood supply. And then the next commonly used is the vein from the legs, uh, which is the saphenous veins and the leg has a dual system, so the long saphenous system can be used for that. Then there are other things like the forearm arteries and uh, the right-sided mammary artery can be used as well. But these are basically uh, ways that uh, can be used to provide uh, blood supply down the stream. So yeah, at surgery, we we'll get to the heart. Some Most people would arrest the heart. We we'll use a bypass machine to support circulation during that time. So during the operation, you stop the heart physically? Yes. Okay. Well, most people would do. I think that's the most common way most to common. do the operation. Although if you go to India and if you go to Bangladesh, people are very skilled in doing off-pump operations, which is also done in the UK, also done in the US, but by a far lower number of surgeons, where the heart is kept beating, but it can be positioned and it can be stabilized using special devices. And once we have access to those arteries, we open up the artery and we use very fine stitches, very fine sutures to attach one end of the artery or vein that we are using as a conduit. And then the other end is either attached naturally, as in the case of the left memory artery, it already has a natural supply which is not interrupted, so it's a different pathway for blood to flow around or if it's a vein or another artery or a different kind of conduit that we're using, then that has to be attached to the aorta, which is the big artery leaving the heart with the pure blood supply. Then once we're done with that, uh, we make sure that there isn't any bleeding, make sure the heart is functioning okay, make sure the bypasses are working all right in terms of what they're meant to do, in terms of providing the blood supply, and then we close the chest and that's the end of the operation but it's the start of a journey for recovery period for the patient there on. Uh, as you can imagine, it's a big operation to get through. Mm. But that's what we do in theater, and that takes somewhere between three hours. Most operations would take about three hours, some take longer, four hours. Um, yeah, that's about it. I want to ask a special question for, for this is for Shaki. Uh, while you are operating, you stop the heart. How do you supply 
blood to the other so, part of the uh, body during that operation? What do you yes, do? Yes, there is a solution called, we call it a cardioplegia solution. So basically it gives nutrition to the heart and it also gives uh, some electrolytes which stops the heart, like it's very high in potassium. And uh, some people, what they do is they reduce the temperature as well. So like uh, personally, no normally, uh, a normal human being would have a temperature of 36.5. But when I operate, I reduce the temperature to 32 degrees. Someone, some people reduce to 34 degrees. So you are protecting the heart in many ways. You are reducing the temperature, which reduces the metabolic demand of the heart. And then you are giving some metabolites to the heart every 15 to 20 minutes. And also you are giving some electrolytes to keep it still. So when the heart is cold, it's not beating. The oxygen consumption of the heart is low. The, it needs less nutrition. So this is how uh, we do the operation. And if you look statistically, uh, I think only 10 to 15% of surgeons around the world do beating heart surgery uh, in, in, in the whole world. Whereas if you go to countries like Bangladesh and India, it's slightly different, as uh, my colleague has said. Uh, the incidence of uh, off-pump beating heart surgery is more uh, in those situations, in those countries. And you have a special pump which supplies blood to the brain and other part of the body during yes, the operation. It's a, yeah, it's a heart-lung machine. So basically, well, the, when the heart is stopped, the lung is also stopped. The heart-lung machine does the function of the heart. So it has a pump. At the same time, it has an oxygenator, oxygenator. so it, it works as an artificial heart lung. And, uh, you know, it's safe to do operations like that. You can stop the heart for a long time by giving nutrition, doing all the right things. You can keep it alive and you can, uh, the heart starts to beat as soon as you restore the supply of blood to the heart. It's quite interesting. It's quite interesting to just start beating afterwards. Once. Alsan, what is coronary artery bypassing? Sorry, coronary artery spasm. Sorry. Coronary artery spasm. Okay, so um, the artery has these layers called the endothelium, this the, the muscle layer, and then the, another layer uh, and that constitutes the whole artery. The muscle can be sensitive to stimulus and can go into what we call the narrowing. It, that, that's called the uh, spasm, and by definition, this is like transient compromise in the flow and then restoration of the flow. And it could be a variety of reasons. Some people are sensitive to uh, the coronary artery spasm. Sometimes we, when we work in the coronary artery with oil and balloon, we see a spasm. So it could be a variety of reasons. Do they get angina? But usually, yeah, usually this this can give you a transient compromise in flow, and because of that, one can get chest pain we call angina. Angina. Oh, okay. That's quite quite interesting. So it's coronary artery by a spasm. Now, uh, what? How is life after bypass surgery? Vivek, what would you like to say a little bit about it? We got on a few, three minutes left. All right. <laughs> there is a caller as well. I'm going to get the caller as well. We've got three minutes left. Let's see what we can do with him. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, I spoke earlier. I had a question left where I couldn't complete. If you could ask it quickly, we've got three minutes uh, okay. left. I, although I, uh, all the four bypass graphs are open, I still got chest pain time to time. And I have been in hospital many times in the last 20 so, years. And I was told recently that I've got... Uh, which is called uh, micro, uh, small small vessels are, are to, uh, blocked, and that's why nothing could be done except uh, medication. So you had so heart surgery, and, yeah. Uh, or that anything can be done other than this. Okay. So you had heart surgery, and uh, it's all repaired now. You still get chest pain, angina. Um, who's the uh, best person to answer for this question? Uh, we can ask the surgeon or we can ask the cardiologist. Chaudhary, probably. So, I think Chaudhary, probably. Okay, <laughs> so awesome. the macrovascular, you know, the, the, the macrovascular means that the vessels that we can take care by balloon angioplasty stent, but microvasculars are like really 
very minute vessels, and then we cannot do anything much in terms of mechanical intervention, where we use the pharmacological intervention and those drugs that dilates and uh, addressing this will be like nitroglycerin, addressing this will be calcium channel blockers, uh, potassium channel openers, uh, all these that address the, uh, the microvasculature. Uh, sometimes people use those that changes the metabolism, like alteration of the metabolism. We use renolazine also, uh, but these are all the pharmacological agents that you, we use uh, for um, for the microvascular. There is also a good paper on the the preconditioning. That means that you get this and then you actually precondition and you actually increase your exercise tolerance. Okay, thank you very much. We're running out of time, so, sir. You can. Uh... You can always email us or you can always send a message on face, uh, Facebook or, or Twitter and we will answer more in detail about your question. I can always ask my guest speakers and they will, they will be more than happy to answer. But we are running out of time. Let's quickly uh, say what's life after bypass surgery. Um, Vivek, would you like to say something about it? I think... Um most people would find that the benefit it does take some time to recover from a major operation as a bypass so it takes somewhere between two and three months for most people some people may need up to six months to get back to their feet properly but most people would then find that they're able to do much more their risk of heart attacks is lower it doesn't mean that they are off their medications the, the surgery is helped by medication so yes unfortunately the medications carry on as well but that is how most people, active working people, should get back to their work style. And most people would actually find benefit. So, and people are unrestricted once uh, they recover from the operation. So most people should be back to their normal self and uh, be able to carry on with their life. That's great. Thank, thank you, you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, especially uh, Shaquille, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a consultant, cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, who joined us from Oxford, and uh, Vivek uh, also from Oxford, and Asan from USA. It's amazing to be with you. I wish I had more time and uh, we could have talked more about, and uh, unfortunately we ran out of time, and Hargo, it's amazing to have you in the studio. Are you happy with us? Uh, yes, the thank program? you so much. Yeah. Yeah, and really thank nice. you very much for being with us. I'll see you, uh, I'll, maybe we'll meet up in uh, some other program. So, um, so far, today we talked uh, about ischemic heart disease and uh, coronary artery bypass. It's a special subject. We didn't have much time, but we somehow gone through the majority of the stuff which you need to know. But you can always uh, check in, um, in the NHS website for more details. So you can always uh, ask us questions on our Facebook link or on, your, on our Twitter, or you could email us on uh, helpdoc at iron.co.uk. And for, it was really nice having you all here. Thank you for staying with us on Iron's Health Talk with Dr. Akram. If you have any further questions, please email us healthtalk at intv.co.uk. Don't forget that. And Facebook and Twitter. You can always follow me. And um, it's really nice having you all here. And until I see you next time, look after yourselves. Goodbye. <laughs>